everyone. We are now discussing the ever famous, maybe too famous, sometimes infamous, infamous, not infamous, that's not a word, sometimes infamous normal distribution. We say that a random variable x follows the normal distribution, sometimes denoted like so, x, uh, x follows a distribution n, mu sigma, so we say x follows a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma, if it has the PDF, V of X, parameterized by uh, mu and sigma, is equal to, all right, we should probably zoom in for this. Um, it's a fairly, a little complicated. We have one over the square root of two pi sigma squared, uh, so uh, this fraction multiplying with e to the power negative x minus mu squared divided by all in the power uh, 2 sigma squared. It's worth mentioning that often the normal distribution is parameterized not by its standard deviation but rather by uh, its variance and you can kind of see why when you look, when I've written this formula down, yeah, it's possible to take this sigma squared and pull it out in front of the square root, uh, but we can put it inside the square root and then you have, uh, and then everything, you've got sigma squares everywhere, so you could just specify sigma squared directly. And also it feels to statisticians to be, or and probabilists, my apologies, to be more appropriate to parameterize by the variance rather than the standard deviation since it's often easier to work with the variance uh, directly rather than the standard deviation. And uh, in addition to this, you, you could say that parameterizing with the variance generalizes better when you start talking about multivariate versions of the normal distribution. But this is fine for now. Like, admittedly, at at an introductory stats level, it feels somewhat like since the standard deviation is the more uh, natural measure of spread and the variance a little bit more alien, uh, you could argue that to these students, it seems somewhat better to use the standard deviation rather than the variance, but it's fine. So this is the curve. Here is a sketch of the density curve for the normal distribution. Uh, we have... Uh, oops, okay, so here's kind of what it looks like. Uh, we would have, basically, here is the mean. Here is the mean plus one standard deviation. And here's the mean minus one standard deviation. Okay, so we would have, basically, a curve that goes up there. That, uh, within one standard deviation is an inflection point. So it will go from uh, convex to concave at the inflection point, and then uh, it, it's going to be a symmetric curve, and then go from concave back to convex. All right. And this is a simple sketch of what it may look like. Uh, it's peak occurs around uh, the mean and we have our inflection points being within one standard deviation of the mean okay so that's a this is the whenever you hear the words the bell curve they are probably referring to the normal distribution be aware that the normal distribution is not the only bell-shaped curve that is used in probability and statistics. There are other bell-shaped curves. For, for instance, there's the T distribution, there's the Cauchy distribution. Uh, I think I encountered a distribution recently uh, that is meant to model uh, when... Well, okay, it's not really a probability distribution, though, but it's kind of like one. Uh, when someone gets the coronavirus, or no, not coronavirus, when someone gets a virus 
during a pandemic type situation there's a curve for that that looks like the normal but isn't the normal i can't remember what it is though it's like the logistic curve i i, I don't know but yeah um uh, this is usually when people are talking about the bell curve, all in caps, uh, like capitalized and all that, they're talking about the normal distribution. Uh, here is an R plot of the density function of a standard normal curve. Uh, and it's got that bell shape. So, uh, the expected value of a random variable X following this distribution, the variance and the standard deviation will be good, given next. Uh, these should not be shocking at all. The expected value of x is equal to mu. The variance of x is equal to sigma squared. And the standard deviation of x is equal to sigma. So normal random variables are specified by their mean and their variance. Uh, you set the mean and the variance directly with normal random variables. Okay. One property of the normal distribution is the 68.95.99.7 rule, which I'm going to sketch out for you. This is basically a rule of thumb for how much of the distribution is within, uh, let's say, uh, within one standard deviation of the mean. So we got mu plus sigma, mu minus sigma within two standard deviations of the mean. So mu plus two sigma, mu minus two sigma, and within three standard deviations of the mean. So mu plus three sigma, and uh, mu minus three sigma. Okay, so the peak of the curve happens at mu and we'll, and let's see, uh, just kind of getting a sketch. So uh, the inflection points are going to happen with, within uh, one standard deviation. All right, so we could sketch out the curve to look something like this. Okay, so uh, what this rule says is, let's uh, start out within uh, one standard deviation. The area underneath the curve within one standard deviation is going to be 0.68. So within one standard deviation. So mu plus or minus sigma. All right, uh, let's go to within two standard deviations. Okay. So within two standard deviations, so the area underneath the curve, within two standard deviations, so the area underneath the curve within two standard deviations is going to be 0.95. So this will be mu plus or minus two sigma. And then if we go to uh, three standard deviations, so let's uh, have this going. Now let's have this going up and down. Uh, horizontally is rough to draw. Okay. On the other hand, that's kind of a conflicting picture, but you get the idea. Um, within three standard deviations, the area underneath the curve within three standard deviations is going to be 0.997. So this will be mu plus or minus three sigma. Okay. The unfortunate thing about that is I just drew over uh, the text, but I can still read. So uh, let Z follow a normal distribution with mean zero and standard deviation one, 
We then say that the random variable z follows the standard normal distribution. And this distribution is useful since we can relate an arbitrary normal random variable to the standard normal distribution and vice versa. And we can do so like so. Uh, as a, so as a reminder, z is following a standard normal. Uh, mu is an arbitrary normal random variable. No, 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 not mu, sorry. Mu is not a random variable. Uh, so x is an arbitrary normal random variable, so a mean and sigma. In this case, what you get is that if you take a normal random variable, subtract out its mean, and then divide by its standard deviation, the distribution of the resulting variable will be equal to the distribution of uh, the, the random variable z. That is, it's following a standard normal distribution, which should make sense. What this operation does is uh, shift the mean to zero, And then what you do is you uh, scale by sigma or scale by, let's say scale by one over sigma. So you both uh, take your curve along the number line. Oops, I didn't want to erase stuff. All right. Uh, so what you're doing is you're taking your standard normal curve which is located at mu, you are shifting it to the left uh, by, by mu, and then you are compressing the curve. So let's, let's draw like a new curve that's, oops, let's uh, draw a new curve that's centered at zero, and then you compress your curve. So it has a standard deviation of one. All right, that's what that operation is doing. And similarly, we could say that if we take a, our standard normal random variable z, scale it by sigma, and then add mu, the resulting random variable will be equal in distribution to the random variable x, which is following a normal distribution with mean mu and standard, devi standard deviation sigma. Right. What this is doing, it's basically doing the opposite. Uh, we are uh, scaling by sigma. And then we are, uh, and then we are shifting the mean to mu. So to sketch out what this is doing, uh, we start out with our standard normal random variable, which is centered at zero. Uh, we then uh, take that random variable, shift its mean by mu. So we end up with something over here. And then we scale out its uh, standard deviation. So we get a curve with possibly a different standard deviation. It doesn't have to get bigger. It could get smaller too, but you get the idea of scaling. Okay, so uh, let capital phi of little z be the probability that a standard normal random variable is less than or equal to z. This is the CDF of the standard normal distribution. Then if x is the probability of an arbitrary normal distribution, or normally dist of an arbitrary normally distributed random variable, we have, <coughs> excuse me, we have the following relationship between f and phi. f of x is equal to phi of x minus mu over sigma, where phi is the CDF of a standard normal distribution, which means since we can relate any normal distribution's CDF to the CDF of the standard normal random variable, this means that we only need to worry about tabulating values for phi of z, for the standard normal distribution, in order to work with any normal distribution. 
which is what's done in Table 8.3 of Devor's book. And often, many of these statistics and probability books will have tables of the CDF of the standard random variable. And I even remember buying a study card for Math 3074, my stats class. And that table came with a... Uh, no, and that card came with uh, a very small table for C for working with the CDF of a standard normal random variable. And the reason why you can do why they're doing that is because you can get all of the information you need for any normal random variable from that table, which is very nice because you can have just you can have any real number mean and any positive real number standard deviation and have an infinite number of normal random variables. But you only need to print one table because once you have the table for the standard normal, then everything works out great. And additionally, um, let's consider for a second the PDF of a standard nor of a normal random variable. Uh, let's let's consider actually first the PDF of a standard normal uh, phi, which we we will call just phi of x. That's going to be uh, 1 over the square root of 2 pi. Um, actually, let's, let's call this phi of z. It's going to be 1 over the square root of 2 pi e negative z squared over 2. And this is kind of a mess, so let's clean that up. Okay. You, you know by now that CDFs are computed via integration. Because all probabilities are computed via integration when you're working with normal random variables. What then is the antiderivative of this? The answer is basically what you see. The thing is, uh, you, there is no closed for more elementary solution for the antiderivative of a normal random variable. It doesn't exist. It simply doesn't exist. It's And I think, in fact, it's provable that you can't come up with an antiderivative for a normal random variable, uh, for a normal random variable's PDF um, in a, in a, in, in any element in any elementary form so at the end of the day you're just kind of left with saying all right this is ranging from from uh negative infinity to uh i don't know x negative infinity to x you're just left with saying that this is equal to phi of x like that you're kind of left with this uh unsatisfying uh unsatisfying answer where you just say all right phi is this is this integral and yet at the same time this is not a problem in fact nobody really cares nobody really needs to have an antiderivative for what i've written down in black nobody really needs it because we have numerical routines that can compute these integrals Mathematically, we can still work with it. There's nothing that says that we can't work with this. We have the fundamental theorem of calculus that is able that tells us how to take derivatives of this thing. So we can take derivatives. We can still study its properties. We can study how how quickly it grows and decays and and stuff like that. There's really no reason we need a simpler expression for the antiderivative of a normal random variable. So we just say this is true by def this is true by definition and go about our business because whenever we need to actually compute uh, what the cdf is we have techniques for doing it uh we can use all of these numerical routines uh numerical routines maybe some monte carlo simulation something like that there's all sorts of things that we can do to compute the cdf and you only need to do it once for the standard normal curve. In fact, I think R actually internally, when when working with the CDF of a, a stand of of um, 
of normal random variables is wor it's working with an internal table uh, that computes uh, probabilities. So, um, admittedly, I'm teaching this right now in an online format in a context where students are not going to ever enter a testing center. So they don't need to use the table. And if I were teaching this in a regular semester, I would teach students to uh, use the table. And it just feels like right now that's silly because they have access to R and they're not going to want to use the table. And I've all, never really had a problem with teaching the table from a pedagogical perspective because I feel like using the table was good practice for working with the uh, uh, basic properties of the normal distribution. And now I don't really see a reason to use it. I mean, there is still that pedagogical reason, but it's just completely uh, swamped by the convenience of having R around. So we're going to lose that. And I'm actually rather sad that this time I'm not really going to use the table, that I'm just going to compute probabilities using R. But hopefully you can still get the message and understand some of the properties that would be learned by working with the table, uh, such as the symmetry of the normal distribution or working with one minus and stuff like that. Okay, um, if I ever teach this class again in person, uh, maybe what I maybe I would, and if I were to use these lecture videos again, maybe I would create a separate video for uh, working with the table, but I don't think I will do that now. All right, so um, anyway, let's compute the following. We're now working with a standard normal random variable. So remember that this is a random variable uh, with uh, a mean, oof, I can do better than that. Hold on. Okay, so this is a random variable. Good grief. Good grief, come on, just... <sighs> Some people just don't want to press the undo button. <laughs> Good grief. Ugh, this screen. How I hate it. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so remember that we are working with the standard normal distribution, so it's a distribution Standard at zero, standard deviation one. I'll just tell you that standard deviation is one. I want to compute the probability that z is less than or equal to zero. Uh, so this is what the normal distribution looks like. This is the area that I want to compute. What is that area? Well, we know the area under the entire curve is one because it's a PDF. And we know that we're shading the area to the left of zero and the zero is the point of symmetry. So that means half the area. So if you were to fold the curve over on itself around zero, it would have equal area to the left and to the right of zero, which means that this must be half of the area underneath the curve. So that means that this is going to be equal to 0 0.5 because zero is the median of a standard normal distribution. All right. Uh, next, what is the probability that Z is less than or equal to 1.23? Okay, so what we're shape so what we're computing here, here is a standard normal curve. Here is one point two three. We are computing the area underneath the curve and to the left of one point two three. Okay, and at this point, I'm going to ask R what that area is. So. Okay, so I want a P norm. By default, P norm is working with a standard normal curve. So we've got P norm of uh, right, uh, 1.23. So that's going to be 0.8906, uh, or we'll say 0.8907. So this will be 
this is equal to 0 0.8907. Okay. Uh, let's see, next up. Oh, look at that, some R code. And uh, it's basically confirming what we got via R. <laughs> so not shocking. All right, next up, the probability that a uh, standard normal variable variable is between negative 1.97 and 2.1. So this will be, we've got the standard normal curve. Okay, here's zero, here's uh, 2.1. Here's negative 1.97. And we want the area in this region, the area in between 2.1 and negative 1.97. So how are we going to do that? Well, one thing we could do is say, remembering that we are working with a CDF, that uh, this is going to be the area underneath the curve to the left of 2.1 minus the area underneath the curve to the right of negative 1.97. So you just subtract out the area from the left of negative 1.97 from the area that's to the left of 2.1. You can think of that as you have a piece of construction paper and this piece of construction paper can, is the uh, normal curve including the region uh, underneath the normal curve, that's a really long piece of construction paper since uh, the normal curve extends from negative infinity to infinity, right? I never put any sort of bounds on this curve. So I hope you notice that, that this is a random variable that can take any number, any real number between negative infinity and infinity. Um, so we, uh, uh, but, you know, we imagine that we have this. Uh, maybe we clipped it off after a certain point and... Uh, which is fine because after after a while the normal curve becomes minuscule, so so minuscule, uh, because it it approaches zero very very quickly. One way to interpret the thirty eight sixty eight ninety five ninety nine point seven rule is saying that almost all of the curve is within three standard deviations, and there's almost nothing outside of it. So and that goes even more so for four standard deviations, five standard deviations, and so on. There's almost nothing there. Um, anyway, we have we imagine that we have this piece of construction paper, and we we uh, clip off the area at two point one and have the area underneath the curve and to the left of two point one, and then we clip off the area underneath the curve to the to the left of negative one point nine seven, and what we end up with is the area that we want. So we met, or in, and if we, what we could end up doing is we start out by measuring the area underneath the curve. Uh, the, the area of our construction paper when we did our first clip, when we clipped at 2.1, and uh, we measure that area, and then we clip again at negative 1.97 and measure the area of the part that we clipped off, and then subtract that from our earlier calculation to get the area that's remaining uh, uh, for our construction paper. So this will be uh, phi... Uh, Remember this. Remember that capital phi is the CDF of a standard normal random variable. So phi at two point one minus phi at negative one point nine seven. Okay, and then we need to compute this. So p norm uh, two point one minus p norm. Uh, negative 1.97 and this is what we get so we get 0.9577 so we get oops uh, so we get that this is equal to uh, 0.9577 okay uh, next example the probability that z is greater than or equal to 1.8 so this is the area underneath the normal curve that's to uh, the right of 1.8. Okay, and we say that this is going to be, well, we could say that this is uh, the area underneath the entire curve. So here I've shaded the whole thing 
minus the area underneath the curve uh, to the left of 1.8. Going back to our construction paper analogy, you have this piece of construction paper that has that's the the area underneath the entire curve, uh, and you clip off the uh, the uh, part at 1.8, and you're left with uh, the part from negative infinity up to 1.8. So you lost the other part, and you want to figure out the area of the other part. Well, you knew the entire area was one, so you measured the area of the part that's that you um, the the part to the left of uh, to the left of 1.8 and subtract that from 1 to get uh, to get the area that's underneath the curve and to the right of 1.8. So uh, this would be 1 minus the CDF of the standard normal at 1.8. And we can go to R and compute this. So 1 minus P norm. 1.8 and this is going to be 0 0.0359 so this is 0 0.0359 okay excellent uh, the probability that it's greater than 5.2 uh, so this is going to be approximately zero but I'll go ahead and uh, compute this in R and say 1 minus p norm. Uh, what was the number we were plugging in? 5.2? Okay, 5.2. All right, very, very, very small number. Uh, not quite numerically zero because we can go to 16 decimal places, but very, very close. Um, very small number. And actually, if you were using the table, and if you look at most tables, most tables don't go beyond four standard deviations. They might not even go beyond three, or three and a half. Uh, but you'll almost never see a, a table go beyond four standard deviations. And, then th and here we're asking for the area underneath the curve to the left of five standard deviations. So uh, if we were actually using the table, which is uh, the context in which these notes were written, uh, we would say, I, what I would basically tell students is say, this is approximately zero. So don't even bother to uh, look at the table. Just say, this is approximately zero. Okay. Here's some R code that's doing all of these calculations. Uh, we also we also could have done some of that one minus stuff using the lower tail uh, parameter. Let's see, is that different from what we had? No, it's not different. So uh, that looks to be about the same. Um, all right, uh, next example. So IQ scores are said to be normally distributed with mean 100 and standard deviation 15. Let Q be randomly selected, be a randomly selected individual's IQ score. Uh, compute the probability that Q is between 85 and 115. So in this case, this was, here's another thing. Um, this is, there's a lot of reasons why I really liked working with the table. And one of the things that was great about working with the table was that it forced you to translate from a normal distribution to a standard normal distribution or any normal distribution to standard normal. Uh, and thus I felt like it would force students to learn the relationship between any normal random variable and a standard normal random variable. So what we could st say here is that this is going to be the probability that 85 minus the so Q is going to be according to this problem a normal random variable with mean 100 and standard deviation 15 so this will be 85 minus 100 over 15 uh, that's less than or equal to Q minus 100 over 15 which is less than or equal to 115 minus 100 over 15. And this part right here is equal in distribution to a standard normal random variable Z. So 
So we could say that this is equal to, after you compute that lower and upper bound, you'll find that this is the probability that negative one is less than or equal to z, which is less than or equal to one, which is going to be about 0.68 because of the 68, 95, 99.7 rule. So you really wouldn't even have to go the, oh, I, okay. So 0.68 is very much an approximation. It's not exactly true, uh, but it's kind of close. It's, I think it's true if you round to two decimal places. So, um, well, I'm actually not really sure. Uh, but yeah, you do have this. Um, and this is basically forcing us to convert to the standard normal case. Um, the unfortunate thing, though, is that now I could just do this. You could do p norm um, uh, 115 uh, mean equals 100. And uh, the other parameter is SD is equal to 15 minus p norm uh, 85 mean equals 100, SD equals 15. And we get 0.6826 or 27. Uh, if we wanted to, uh, we could instead have written P norm 1 minus P norm negative 1. And they get the same number uh, using basically that alternate form because you might not be converting uh, you might not be converting to a standard or random variable but r i'm pretty sure is so all right there's computing that uh this so the sad thing is that you can just do that and now i can't force you to uh use a table and uh and uh, convert <laughs> uh and uh, convert to a standard normal random variable that's unfortunate Okay, uh, so the probability that Q is greater than 90. You know what? I can't force you to do it, but I can still do it because I still have a point to make, right? So this is going to equal the probability that Q minus 100 over 15 is greater than 90 minus 100 over 15 which is equal to uh, 1 minus the CDF of a standard normal curve, uh, standard normal random variable at, uh, at a 90 minus 100 over 15. This part becomes uh, 10 over 15, or negative 10 over 15, which is negative 2 thirds. So I would say uh, this is going to be phi at I'll even round it. I'll or I'll even convert it to a decimal number. So negative 0 0.67, which is approximate, but this is supposed to be uh, negative two thirds. And then I go to R and compute this and say this is one minus p norm uh, uh, negative two thirds which is 0.7475. So this is approximately equal to 0.7475. All right, next up, the International Society for Philosophical Inquiry requires potential members to have an IQ of at least 135 in order to join the society. This is one of those uh, so-called genius societies. Uh, based on this, what proportion of the population is eligible for membership so um this is the probability that an individual's iq is at least 135 which is equal to uh the probability that q minus 100 over 15 is greater than or equal to 135 uh hold on uh, let's move this. So this is equal to probability that Q minus 100 
over 15 is greater than or equal to 135 minus 100 over 15, which is equal to uh, the probability that a, well, okay, this is going to be uh, 1 minus the CDF of a normal variable or 1 minus phi at, so 135 minus 100 over 15 is 35 over 15, uh, which is 7 thirds. Which is about 2.33. Okay, so about 2.33. So 1 minus P norm, 2.33. Actually, we'll just do 7 divided by 3. So 0 0.0098. So this is approximately 0 0.0098. Okay. And here is some R code where I'm actually calling these mean functions, SD function, uh, as, so mean SD parameters, also using lower tail, uh, rather than doing one minus the, the CDF and so on. All right, uh, so that was all trying to compute probabilities, but sometimes we want to compute quantiles. So we've got the notation Z alpha, which means that uh, the CDF of at Z alpha is equal to one minus alpha. We can relate this back to general uh, percentiles to find for arbitrary normal, uh, normally distributed random variables because these are the percentiles uh, of um, standard normal random variables. Okay, so this is going to, so we have in general, eta p is going to be uh, sigma z one minus p uh, plus mu. That's our percentile formula. And z one minus alpha can be found using table 8.3 using a reverse lookup, but since you now have r, there's really no point about discussing reverse lookups like this. Okay. Oh, I mean, I felt like they were good practice, but we're now not going to be doing that anymore. All right, so uh, what is Z 0.5? That's the median of a standard normal. Z 0.5 is the area where the curve is split in two equal parts, and that's going to be zero. Uh, what is Z 0.05? Well, uh, what we could do is say, all right, let's go to P norm. No, 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 we're not using P norm anymore. We're using Q norm. So Q norm uh, 0 0.05. So uh, you could put in 0 0.99, uh, no, put put in 0 0.95 instead. That would get us the same thing. This is gonna be one minus, uh, so this is one minus 0 0.05. Or alternatively, we could do Q norm 0 0.05 lower dot tail equals false. And that also works. Those all get us the same number. So in the end though, this is about 1.64. So this is, so uh, Z 0 0.05 is about 1.64. Okay, uh, what are the first and third quartiles of the standard normal distribution? So what we're looking for is a Z. So the first quartile will be Z 0.75 because remember we're doing up. So the, uh, so here the uh, subscript of the Z is the upper tail area. So this is the first quartile. And the third quartile is Z 0.25. This is Q3. All right, so what are those going to be? Well, we go to R and say Q norm 0.75 lower dot tail 
equals false. So we get negative 0 0.67. So negative 0 0.67. And this one, well, actually, I'm not even going to bother computer because I know what it is. It's 0 0.67. Because we're working with a symmetric curve. Since we're working with a symmetric curve, if we know one of those things, then we know the other one. Because if the area underneath the curve to the left of Z7.75 is 0.75, Two five. The area underneath the curve to the right of point z point two five is also point two five. So all we ever did was just flip over the uh, flip over the y axis, where x is equal to zero. Oh no, let's not put a y there. That's just confusing. But my stupid undo button isn't working. Ugh. Gosh, why does stuff have to be so moody? Anyway. Um, well, since we're working with a symmetric distribution, we actually have a property that I think gets written down, uh, later. Uh, where did I write it down? Did I, was I supposed to write it down up here? Where did I write it? I know I wrote it down. I know that I plan on talking about it at some point in, uh, these lecture notes. Oh, I wrote about it on page 21, but basically I'll, 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 I'll just cut to the chase and write it right now. Uh, so Z alpha is equal to negative Z one minus alpha. So basically uh, you can just flip over the, flip over the Y, uh, the uh, Y axis. So change the sign and work with one minus that area and you can get the same quantiles. So, but if it, if it makes you feel better, I'll go ahead and compute it. And this is 0.25. Yeah. So what I did basically was exploit the symmetry of the standard normal distribution. It's symmetry around zero. All right. Description of the random variable Q from example 11. Uh, so using that, answer the following questions. Mensa International requires individuals have an IQ score that will place them in the top 2% of the population What's the minimum IQ score needed to be a member of Mensa? Well, that would be, um, so the standard deviation is 15. We've got Z, so top 2%, so that's gonna be 0 0.02. The upper tail area is 0 0.02, plus 100. And this is going to be, let's see, we've got 15 times Q norm, 0.02 lower dot tail equals false plus 100 130 or I guess he'd round it to 131 uh, so we'll say 131 uh, after rounding so 131 you need to have an IQ of 131 in order to be a member of Mensa uh, there's an alternative way to do that though we could have instead uh, we could have instead done a Q norm 0.02 mean equals 100 SD equals 15 lower dot tail equals false that would have also worked okay uh, the part of the population with the lowest 5% of IQ scores is considered to be intellectually disabled what is the highest IQ score needed to be in this group okay so uh, that means that we are looking at uh, Z 0.95 or actually we're asking for eta of 0.05 uh, uh, up here in this problem we were looking for eta of 0.98 okay so this is going to be 15z 0.95 plus 100 and then we go and compute that so in this case, we got 0.95 now. This is going to be 75.32. So we'll say um, about after rounding uh, 75. So if you have a so if you have an IQ score of 75 or lower, you're considered uh, intellectually disabled. Okay. So right there's some R code that's doing the same thing. 
So due to the symmetry of the normal distribution, we have the following useful identities for phi. Uh, one second. Okay, we have that the CDF at Z is equal to one minus the CDF at negative Z, which what this is saying is uh, if you were looking at, so this is a standard normal distribution if you were looking at uh, the area underneath the curve and to the left of Z, another way you could compute that quantity is look at the area underneath the curve and to the right of negative Z, which is what, hap which is what you get when you flip over the uh, Y axis, and then subtract that from one to get the, to get the red area underneath the curve. So the, so the area above negative Z um, is going to be equal to the area below Z. Or the area to the right of negative Z is equal to the area to the left of Z because of the symmetry of the curve. And equivalently, well, as a consequence of this, we have Z alpha is equal to negative Z 1 minus alpha. That's our immediate consequence. All right, so as mentioned before, phi can be used to approximate the CDF of other random variables. So it turns out that the normal distribution can be used to approximate the uh, CDF of other random variables, or uh, approximate other random variables, basically. Um, which, of course, mattered more historically when we didn't have... Uh, when, when we had to basically physically print out tables for random variables but you still want to be able to get probabilities for uh, binomials with large parameters, large n, or uh, Poisson random variables with large uh, mu. But uh, in this situation, um, like in the, in the world in which we currently live, that's less of an issue because software doesn't ask you how big n is. It just works. So, um, all right. So, well, I guess it does literally ask you, <laughs> but... Uh, it, it's not like you put in the wrong number and it will just not work. Um, unless, of, part, of course, you put in something that's really big to the point that software can handle it. But that's highly unlikely. Uh, anyway, uh, still, the fact that certain random variables can be approximated by normal random variables is not only important, it's getting to fundamental theorems of statistics and probability uh, that will be discussed in uh, Chapter 5. So, uh, let's say, for example, let's work it. Let's work with a binomial random variable when n, uh, the uh, the sample size is large. The CDF of a binomial random variable at x uh, with parameters n and p, and here we're assuming that n is somewhat large. Uh, you should probably say, well, okay. So a rule of thumb is that n times p is greater than or equal to ten and n times 1 minus p is greater than or equal to 10. That's one rule of thumb that they're using. Um, we could probably say that if your p is between uh, 0.1 and 0.9, then a, a sample size of 40 is probably fine. So this is going to be approximately equal to uh, the CDF of a standard normal random variable evaluated at x minus the mean of the random variable, which is np because that's the mean of a binomial, divided by the standard deviation of a binomial, which is n times p times 1 minus p. And then, in addition to this, we do plus 0.5. The plus 0.5 is what's known as a continuity correction. Uh, it accounts for the fact that we are using a continuous random variable to uh, approximate a discrete random variable. Um, if you didn't do this, then you often end up with some numerical inaccuracy with the approximation. The approximation is still at some level true, but it's just off. And you get better, um, you get better approximate computations for, say, the CDF when you include this uh, continuity correction. I think the justification 
for why you add plus 0.5 is you could imagine that you have this uh, probably mass histogram and your <clears throat> and your uh, and uh, the uh, PDF or CDF of the normal curve would uh, be going through it basically at the left endpoints. So you'd have something that's uh, looking like this. And if you shift everything over to the right, yeah, I think it's to the right when you add do plus or no, it's to, it's to the left. But when you shift the curve, oops, oh, the undo button is not working. When you shift the curve over a little bit, you get like a better pass through uh, these uh, histograms. So it's like recentering so that it's centered evenly um, on the uh, uh, on the uh, probability histogram or this uh, probably mass function understood as a histogram. Anyway, uh, let's let's work. Let's do an example. A manufacturer will reject a batch of widgets if in a sample of 100 randomly selected widgets of the batch, uh, 15 or more are defective. If 12% of the widgets in the batch are defective, what's the probability of rejecting the batch? So the random variable in question is, uh, we'll call it S. And it's following a binomial distribution. Uh, the, the parameter N is 100. And the parameter P for the probability of getting a defective widget is 0.12. Okay, so the approximating normal random variable follows a normal distribution with what is going to be in the mean? Well, it's going to be the sample size times P, so that's 12. And then we've got a uh, standard deviation, which is going to be uh, the square root of 100 times 0 0.12 times 0 0.88. Okay, so the standard deviation is about 3.25. So 3.25. This is the distribution of the approximating normal random variable. So S's distribution is approximate. Uh, so S is approximately equal in distribution to X. So then when we want, so, okay, reject the batch. When is the batch rejected? The batch is rejected when uh, 15 or more widgets are defective. So we're looking at the probability that S is greater than or equal to 15. And this is going to be uh, 1 minus the CDF of this random variable at, um, uh, hold on, uh, yeah, at 14. Uh, and it's got parameters 100 and 0.2 and 0.12. Okay, and this is, according to our normal approximation, approximately equal to uh, 1 minus phi. And we've got uh, 14 minus 12 divided by 3.25. And then we add in the continuity correction, 0 0.5. And what is this going to be equal to? Well, we've got 1 minus P norm. So we've got, uh, so 14 minus 12 plus 0 0.5 divided by 3.25. So 0 0.2209. And just for reference, we could have alternatively computed uh, P binom, and uh, we would have used uh, 14 uh, size equals 100, prob equals 0.12, and we would have said lower dot tail equals false. Yeah, so that's pretty close to what we 
uh, got using the normal approximation. Okay. All right. So, uh, scrolling down. Oh, did I? Oh, something's different. Uh, on the other hand, is the R code wrong? Uh, okay, it looks like I might have made a mistake here. So, the probability that S is greater than or equal to 15 is the probability that is one minus the probability that S is less than or is strictly less than 15, which is one minus the probability that S is less than or equal to 14. So, I think that my R code in these, in this, yeah, I think that I did not put in, yeah, or, hmm, curious. I don't know, I, I'm, I'm thinking actually that this might be wrong. on a second look. Okay, uh, but you get the point at the very least. And by the way, I would suggest using the normal pro approximation at the very last step. So right when you're about to compute something and that you don't know how to compute. So like for example, um, I guess I should probably write down what steps I've kind of been omitting. I can say this is the probability that S is no this is one minus the probability that s is less than 15 which is one minus the probability that s is less than or equal to 14. so here i um basically was still treating s as if it were a discrete random variable you should still do that uh you should like if i was treating this as a Continuous random variable, I would not be caring so much about whether I was working with less than or less than or equal to. But you should you should still treat your random variable that you're approximating with a normal random variable as if it's discrete up until the final point when you need to compute something like the CDF. Okay? Uh, so that's what I recommend. All right. Uh, the approximation works for Poisson random variables as well when uh, this lambda parameter is large, or I think it was, I don't know why I wrote lambda here. I think that might be because the book's using lambda. I'm not really sure why, because of what I remember is that in chapter three, I was using mu to write down Poisson random variables. Okay, but whatever. Um, so in this case, the approximating distribution for a Poisson random variable, uh, uh, let, let's suppose that um, X follows a Poisson distribution uh, with mean parameter uh, mu. Then we could approximate it with Y, which is following a normal distribution with mean mu and standard deviation square, square root of mu. Because the standard deviation of a Poisson random variable is, square root, is the square root of mu. Okay? Uh, so... Suppose that X follows a Poisson distribution with parameter 100. Let's estimate the probability that X is less than or equal to 110. So uh, the probability that X is less than or equal to 110 is approximately equal to phi at 110 minus 100 plus 0 0.05, that's the continuity correction, divided by uh, the square root of 100, which is 10. So this is going to be, this is going to be the CDF at uh, 10.5 divided by 10, which is 10.5 minus 10, uh, no, divided by 10. Oh, oh yeah, that's a 1.05. So that's going to be 0 0.8531. Okay, uh, let's compare that 
to uh, to what we would have had uh, if we used the Poisson distribution directly. So 110 and uh, lambda is equal to 100. Oh, very close, very, very close. So a good approximation. All right. Okay, that's that concludes this section. This is a very important section, very, very important, because the normal distribution is a distribution that is appearing all over the place. So, and not just in this chapter, but in later chapters too. Uh, chapter 5, chapter 7, chapter 8, you're going to be using the normal distribution all the time. It's going to be assumed that random variables are normally distributed. So you need to get comfortable with this distribution. All right, so work on problems for this. Make sure you understand it. If you don't understand it, fix that. And yeah, it's it's your responsibility to fix it. Part of the way you fix it is by asking me what you don't understand. <laughs> right, so um, like uh, par part of how you fix not understanding something is getting help when you need it, all right, from, from whoever could possibly help you. But you need to fix what you don't understand. Please, please learn the normal distribution inside and out, and you will be rewarded for it. All right, so that's it for uh, this, uh, this section, and I will see you in the next section when we talk about exponential random variables, which we've already talked about quite a bit, and also the gamma distribution, which is an interesting distribution, often shows up in applications and also in a more uh, theoretical setting. Okay, uh, all right, so see you then.